Actually, it's flying solo. When you are using distributions talking KDE, you are flying solo every time. That's why. KDE suffered resistance in most environments. It was mostly everyday fight. Why? Because sometimes, someday, some intelligent people say the, the GNOME is the definitive desktop for the Linux. And at the same time, every distribution start to look in Linux uh, as GNOME Linux, and they start to put developers in GNOME. I start to put a lot of people in distributions, GNOME, te GNOME technology there, and suddenly you are alone fighting against GNOME technology to integrate and everything. So it's very, very difficult job there. We are always forced to know how to interact and deal with several known KDE software. Since everyone is dealing with GNOME or, diff or different technologies, and you are flying solo because nobody is caring really in KDE, I'm talking about seven, six years ago, we need to learn how to deal with problems with X. We need to deal with problems like Dbus and every else thing that happened. So there's no way you could package and understand KDE without understanding a full Linux distribution and full desktop system. It's very, very complex. And you need to adapt. Because uh, we're talking distributions, we're talking not uh, KDE project itself. So someone in the management say, GNOME do that, or this is beautiful, you should do that way. Even break in some way the KDE works, or you're pushing some invalid patch that the people don't accept upstream, you need to live with that. So it's basically, you need to manage how to keep things in the middle management, making people of distribution happy and making project happy. First thing, be humble and talk each other. Why this? You're not alone. That's the first uh, thing. Because uh, the same way that you are suffering when the, uh, dealing with KD in distribution, other distributions are suffering too. There's people alone in other distributions trying to package KDE. And unless you are stubborn enough or you are want to keep your thing like it's exclusive or everything, usually every distribution talk with each other about patches, about how to solve problem, about how to do anything. So trying to do everything by yourself and say my distro is better is probably a, a, a path to fail, probably. A look and talk with competition is, uh, is not an issue. It's a win competition situation. Uh, Will is here and know very well. And uh, Jonathan is not here, but people from Suzy, Mandriva, uh, Connectiva Times, Ubuntu, even Fedora now, people talk with each other about patches and how to solve things and things. So everyone gets this faster. And it becomes better right now because uh, considering the situation that uh, uh, KD is growing everywhere, it's uh, very good now. Talk about the open issues is not shame. It's a way to say that you are open anyway. It's some, some time, there's some management saying that uh, if you have problems, don't say to other, try to solve, but uh, try to ask different way and just make it hidden to not make it like undermine your distribution. This really not works. Try it many times and not works. It's a completely fail too. You need to open yourself that you have problems to more people see. And for in this case, what happens? People tend to help you. Even users and contributors tend to help you. So at the end, your distribution fix the things and fix things for other things. The chance that other people or other distribution have the same problem is huge because they are not exclusive for you. And offer you easily as well. Like, if you know something very good, put upstream, show to the people. Doesn't matter if upstream doesn't accept, because people like it and they're supposed to help you after the same way. Be stubborn and focused. Why this? You're not alone again. So uh, like the same way that you are doing something that you know very well that fix the problem, even, uh, even being KDE specific, and there's some other people, other developers, or other people from management say, no, say this, make this different. And you need to be stubborn because uh, you, you understand very well that uh, this thing is really the right fix. 
And uh, at this time, it's not because you are, uh, you are the best or fantastic guy. It's just because you already talked it with many people, get some consensus, and know that this is a better fix. So you need to be stubborn to avoid other people to break, the, break your work. From user to contributors to management, they have ideas. This is started the very big problem about the uh, package KDE today. Because distributions have users and distributions have management. Management have fantastic ideas that like we should be like Windows, or should have Mac taskbar. And users say, fix this or fix that. I want this, I want that. And every time you say no to users, they become unpleasant. And every time you say no to your boss, you think that your job is in a thin line. So it's a very complex situation. So that's why you need to become stubborn and to have keep strong, strong and um, how can I say average position that say it's okay. I can do that and need to be this way because otherwise it not, will not work. They think they, that his ideas are right. Everyone that comes to you when you are package and you are a developer comes to you say, "I you should do that because it's right." And you understand very well, because at the point of view for users, they think that his ideas is right. And management think that his idea is right. So you have an uh, ugly position to, to explain that they are wrong and not make it mad to you. And they ever think they are right. So that's why I create flame wars about anything. So be stubborn and try to keep as reasonable possible. Otherwise, you end up in an unfinished work. It's, this is a major pitfall for every packagement and distribution. Because Why? Because every time you try to implement everything that people say to you, and usually you are one, two, or three guys on top to make a whole complex software in the, in the big distribution. You be annoying. Yes, true. Why? Want to know why there are upstream versus downstream issues? Someone, I want examples. Examples, please. Why does some, every time there's a big fight between people blaming upstream and people blaming downstream? Upstream patches. Huh? Patches upstream. OK, patches, but it's, it's too technical. I think it's, it's a little bit uh, more uh, wide than this. Because downstream, this is supposed to be the distributions, always being pressured to have stable things with bleed and edge. Or say, Every time Aaron or someone from the Plasma desktop blogs something about, we're doing this fantastic thing about 4. KD 4.5 or KD 5, the guy from management say, can I put that here now? And that's the way. <laughs> and the second thing is, upstream has no relation to downstream, because of course, they don't work. So if you no reason to help fixing sometimes. And it's true, because otherwise, Oops, uh, downstream say, I don't care about you. It's not my job. I will not pay for you. I do just what I like. So we understand that being a package in a distribution is like a hell of position. Because you need to talk with people that are uh, dealing with other technology, management that want bleed and edge, and downstream upstream that we want to do just what they do and not help you at all. So that's why you be annoying. And uh, most of the people that work in KD projects, Amara guys, Davi Ford mainly, you know that every distro guy jumped from nothing with a lot of questions, in specific questions, trying to solve everything. And usually we are annoying. It's true. But there's no way you can do it without uh, do it this way. And put KD technology on test. Building an entire distro based on KD has minimal resources and intermittent energy in internet. I'm talking about my experience in Angola. It's like two months, I stay there, I arrive it with a target. I need to build from the scratch a whole entire Linux distribution based on KD, based on the ideas that the Angola government made that. What I had, just a set, a set of packages of base, in this case, Mandriva. But I have intermittent energy, Energy is like uh, three or four times a day. They simply go away and take two hours to back. We have internet based on the GSM, uh, 3G internet, but uh, like 200 kilobytes. So imagine this situation. And, uh, and uh, of course, there are a lot of more difficult situations. What's possible to do that? Let's see. You need a flexible environment. 
And who can say that uh, KDE is uh, flexible today? Okay, uh, so I see this. just two people agree with me. And okay, so just Chani and try. But actually KDE is extremely flexible, absolutely. It's very easy to customize in the point of view that when you are working uh, in this thing. You need to be able to accept modifications on the fly. KDE is allowed to do this. K KDE, uh, since the, the, the KDE2 has a lot of infrastructure inside, uh, like a kiosk or anything, that can enable you to make fantastic things. But we have one huge big problem. We have all those things completely undocumented. Most of the people don't know that things is, exist. One of the most important things in KDE today, like kiosk, that's very useful for any kind of company in the world, is completely undocumented, but it's still working very well. And KDE wins, yes. We are able to deploy the distribution and even uh, put training seven people to work and still working today on, on uh, the distribution called Ango Linux. Modif modifying KD is based on KD3, of course, is before then, then. and uh, was not, it was impossible to do anything without any other desktop except KD KDE. They even invented the idea of GNOME in the, in the beginning, but we shut down the idea. And uh, to prove that that, you can find, at the same time, we did a full st install distribution, a USB install distribution, and a live CD. Everything is deployed for at least now we're three countries in, the, in Africa. In Africa, and regarding the new world, desktop computers are not reality anymore. We're not talking anymore about the desktop. We're talking about netbooks. We're talking about small devices, mobile televisions, and every kind of crap thing that have some screen they want to put software inside, and of course. We have KD pushing and everything. KD provides the approach for new medias. It's right. Who can say that? Uh, I think plasma people say, yeah, we are going to netbook, plasma netbook, and anything. But this is right. KD is providing attacking for new medias. Can say no, wrong. I, I say why. The dirty story about interfaces. We're, we're providing a way. To, pro, uh, to put a plasma interface netbook that fits on netbook, and you have our plasma desktop. Who will use it that? I can say to you, nobody. Because people that will deploy that will not use in those defaults. Who use defaults are use, uh, basic users that compile, compile KDE or some distribution. But distributions that deploy in for real world, for companies, OEM deployers, will build something on top. If you should see everyone from Nokia, from Andriva, from, from uh, even Ubuntu, now doing close the design, they're doing their own way to do front end. It's why that? It's just because companies uh, doesn't want to use something that's the same for the other. So we're going to the right path, path almost. Why? Why could, could KDE Tech is going to the right path? The point is, despite our inter front end interface, we have the technology behind. The technology that allows you to simply create these interfaces. So the point is, from the point of view of distributions, it's very good to have a completely layer of software that can provide you easy way to build the interface the way you want but not something tired and fixed that to provide. This interface will be the KDE interface, you should use that. So Plasma is almost there. You can have it in some way that you can customize and create your own interface. So it's, that's the proof that KDE is going, the technology is going the right path. And this is my part, and I think we'll, we'll continue about that. So if you uh, a bit among the, Will is putting his laptop, if you want to do some questions about that, I'm just going to add lib actually, so we okay. do the two questions together. Cause okay, say. that's fine. Um, so, <coughs> yep. uh, Mike. Mike. Um, could you put the raise the slides there, please?
OK, so um, while Jeff's just doing that so I can scribble on the blackboards there, um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Will Stevenson. Um, I've been working at uh, SUSE Linux, part of Novell, for, for the last, I'm going to outscry the baby, <laughs> for the last five years. Um, initially as a KD PIM developer, then as a general purpose KD developer, um, and now as a uh, community multiplier, informally known as the OpenSUSE Boosters team. So, um, and so I've got some experience of the distribution. There's going to be a little bit of overlap with what Helio said because we didn't work on our integration particularly. But um, I'm hoping to tell you why, what KDE in the distribution world has to go through, why free software is going to win, and why you are going to be a part of actually making it win. So, um, KD in the distro world. Distros. So, what do the distributions actually do? Um, you probably, you all use Linux distributions at some time, but here's a set of view of that same activity from the other side of the, of the window glass. We do packaging. We're doing, taking software from upstreams, putting it together, putting it on distributions, putting it on CDs, and putting it out there. We're updating our versions. We're choosing which sets of software come together to make a default installation. We're making choices, composing the software. We're building the software, and we're building it, and we're splitting it so that if we get one big um, KDE base module, we're splitting it into workspace and runtime and the applications like Dolphin and Conqueror and KApp Finder and everything else. So we're really seeing how, how, how a module builds and splitting it up in a very fine way and then putting it back together again in a way that you wouldn't actually know that it'd been, it had been dissected like that. We're doing integration work. We're making sure that um, a particular phonon works with a particular Qt that we've got or, and that the KDK mix works with that phonon, that uh, your Amarok then also works with that, making sure all it's testing. And then other things that below the... the um, KD and the Qt infrastructure, so all of your um, drivers, all of your network managers, all of your X servers, all of those things. Up and down the stack, we've got that activity. We're testing it. We're finding lots of issues and things. So for example, if you write an application and you ship it and you uh, forget to install the icons or something, we've got automated tests which are running as we're building that software. And we're fixing that so that the, your, your application is appearing at the right p point in the menu with the right icon, hopefully. We're choosing defaults. We're actually pre-configuring the software so it looks good, so it looks better, it works better than the default um, KD installation that you get if you build it from source yourself. We're doing maintenance. We've got um, bugs that are being fixed. We've got uh, security bugs that are being reported. There's a whole world of um, security disclosures happening behind the scenes that you don't see unless you're working a distribution until it's the day when we all agree to, di to put those changes out that we've fixed with some notice from some hacker or some security researcher who's uh, notified us of those. Um, we're fixing straight old bugs. We're getting loads of bug reports every day, and we're going out and fixing those um, and doing software updates because of those. We're doing level three work. Um, anyone who's worked in tech support knows what L3 is. It's the third line of defense after a user comes in with a problem. Um, it goes through some unskilled guy, then a semi-skilled guy, and eventually ends up with an expert. And they have some level of service guarantee who says, we're going to fix it in 24 hours if you're a, if someone, if you're a paying customer who does that. So we're doing a lot of that. We're triaging incoming bugs. Every day, um, we get about, I get about 25 bugs come in personally, and probably another 15 which are of interest to me in the KDE bugs at uh, OpenSUSE that I would then look at. So you've got to keep on top of those bugs. You look, look away for a week, you know, you've got 210 bugs or something. And then we're doing features work. When I started working at OpenSUSE, I thought, well, great, I'm just going to be paid to hack on KD all day long. And those bugs, you know, I'm just such a cool KD developer, I'm going to be able to get those bugs out and sort it in about two, a day and then six days of hacking a week. Great. Not like that. It's actually, it's more like less than 5%, I would say, is how much of my time I get to spend on actual development, unfortunately. 
we're gathering feedback. We're talking to all the users. We're talking. We're observing what people say on mailing lists, in forums, online, and we're passing that back up to product managers and people who actually design distribution and dictate where the distribution goes. Um, we're talking to upstream. We're, we're pushing our changes back upstream if we get time, or we're complaining about things. And um, we're dealing with legal issues. So for most people, that's MP3 codecs, but actually goes a lot. It does a lot more detailed work than the relatively exciting things. Are, can we ship an MP3 codec? Um, we got licensing. If you um, distribute a tarball and you forget to put that. Um, copying.lib or that license file or whatever in your tarball. Um, when we distribute that, we're um, breaking the GPL because we're not, actually we're not actually distributing the full license code. And that could expose us to lawsuits from you or anyone else who's using that software that's based on that GPL because we're not distributing in a form that they can then go on and use. So it takes this amazing attention to detail. And we're distributing software. We've got to do that securely. Because so many people are downloading what we're doing, we've got a massive um, attack possibility there, where our, the, ex the surface that we expose to attack is really quite significant. So we've got to take an amazing amount of care with our desktop machines. If I install Google Chrome, do I know what the hell it's actually doing on my desktop workstation? Is it changing the source code somewhere on the NFS share where the, the, the SUSE source tables are stored? It could be. I don't know. And same Adobe Flash could be doing the same thing. The mind boggles. So we've got an amazing responsibility. And then we're doing enterprise products as well. Um, as uh, Professor Bourne said earlier, it's all services. So what pays me to do open SUSE work is doing things like SUSE Linux Enterprise. It's Halio going to Angola and making things for Angolan government. And that takes a lot of work. We, um, you have to limit the package selection. You have to then support it for a long period, like maybe like seven years in the case of SLEE. That takes skills. That means that um, SLEE 10 went out in 2006. That means that seven years of support, that I'm still going to be fixing KDE 3 and AutoMake and AutoConf in 2013, which is not that far away now. But you've got to keep those skills live to support all this old software. Um, otherwise, you're relearning everything from scratch. And you've got to make sure you've got continuity between releases, because people who are deploying your software, they're developing their own things based around that. And then if you take a KDE3-based SLE 10 and a KDE4-based SLE 11, and someone's written some custom scripts, you're going to have to have some answers for them so that their scripts are going to carry on working. Um, and you've got to relate to upstreams. Upstreams are continually changing stuff. Um, developers walk away, apps no longer maintained, you have to throw it out. They're adding dependencies, like a um, new version of OpenOffice adds a Python dependency, and suddenly all your packages blow up by like 40 megabytes. And those 40 megabytes, they're all gone from your live CD, because you can't not ship a live CD without OpenOffice, if that's what you did the last time. So then you've got to find 40 megabytes of space on the disk to, um, by throwing out, you know, Czech language or Italian or something, or, or not shipping the GIMP, <laughs> things like that. Um, and then you've got to deal with the user backlash, because you've got some user who thought, you know, KView is the best ever image viewer ever, and it's just not there in KDE4 uh, until recently, not by default. Um, and you've got to face those users and tell them why it's not there anymore and why, um, why that decision's been made. Um, you're the where the buck stops for a lot of lot of uh, a lot of your users and a lot of your consumers, and you've got to do things like maintaining KD three for years and years. So then, and those are just some of the things that we do today. Today, so we've got challenges. We've got some fairly awful things happening. We've got to meet everyone's expectations. You know, you're taking a KD four only version distribution. There, there's no KD three there anymore. People really want that KD three, and they really want those little hide arrows at the end of the kicker bar that may hide the kicker panel. And Aaron's never going to implement that because he thinks that you don't need that anymore. And you've got to either fix it yourself, or you've got to patiently explain. And some of these guys are really, really stubborn. I mean, Helio said. It, you've got to be. I'm not. I'm not not a not a stubborn guy by nature, but I have to make it. So um, you've got to make your release cycles in sync with upstreams. You've got several. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth has talked about this at length, so you're probably familiar with the concept. But you've got um, a release coming out once or twice a year. 
maybe one time you're going to have a really bang new GNOME, the next year you're going to have a really good KDE and a, quite an old GNOME, and that causes tensions inside the distribution, tensions among your users, users saying, oh, why can't you wait two months, ship, ship KDE 4.4.0 rather than KDE 4.3.5 or something. A lot of decisions to make. Um, all the time, the pressure to have the latest, newest stuff is making your product cycle shorter and shorter. So you find yourself where once you would do an OpenSUSE release, and then you do a SUSE Linux Enterprise release, and then the next OpenSUSE release, you find yourself doing two things at the same time. There's that overlap there. And you've got to get it, keep on getting it right. Because once you put it on the DVD and a lot of people install it, you better hope that your update system is able to handle the mistakes that you made when it updates it post-installation. You've got internal conflicts. As, as Hiller said, he's got external pressure from people who um, think that GNOME is the be-all and end-all of the Linux desktop. And then you've got your internal GNOME teams, your internal KDE teams, or you've got Postgres and the MySQL maintainer not speaking to each other. <laughs> it's not as bad as the GNOME and KDE thing, but believe me, it's there. Just, uh, just a note, that's an interesting uh, thing that happened in the network. Management decided to drop KDE 3 and using just KDE 4. Then a lot of users, contributors, say you need KD3. So at the, uh, like uh, two weeks before he leaves the distro, management say that we should ship KD3 for working and the mainstream together with KD4. So you need to back it the whole distribution in two, in two weeks. Because users are blaming management, management back it, back off, and wonder why who are in the middle to solve the issue. <laughs> Yeah, well, with, with those internal conflicts, you saw um, last summer we had the decision to open SUSE. We opened up the distribution features list, and the number one feature by our friend Frank over there, which went where normally a, a really popular feature would get maybe 100 votes over the entire time that feature was open. Um, Frank's feature, which was um, KDE 4 as the default desktop, went from 0 to 400 in about two weeks. And from then on, it carried on climbing. And there wasn't that usual, something gets a bit popular, and then the people who dislike it vote against it, and it goes back down again. Oh, no, it just carried on going up and up and up. So we had something that we really couldn't, couldn't avoid acting on. And that caused an amazing amount of tension inside the distribution. We had tension between the, uh, the teams. We had tension between product management. We had tension between the community um, distribution, where we could do pretty much what the hell we liked, because um, Novell executive management said, you have carte blanche to do what you want. And the enterprise distributions, which are, have a long policy of being GNOME is the desktop that is installed by default. And if you want to KD, you have to go through the package manager. So you have to fight these issues, see them through to a conclusion while still staying sane and doing all those other day-to-day -day things as well. You have to deliver constant improvement. Uh, it might be that, that version 1.6 of the Xorg Intel uh, driver is really good, and then 1.7 introduces some um, new uh, 3D um, Gallium um, DRI thing, and it absolutely sucks. But you're going to get hit for it and spanked for it by your users when their desktop slows down to a crawl. So in effect, it's like trying to like juggle balls while standing on big cubes of jelly or like one of those, <laughs> one of those soft play things. You have, you know, for your kids, where you take your kids and they play in like a load of soft things. You ever tried like tap dancing on one of those? It's kind of what's like doing this job. And you've got to make changes work throughout the stack. So. You get a new version of Network Manager, which comes in, which is really good at UMTS, um, sorry, GSM 3G phones. But then you've got to make sure that you have your, the right versions of, um, of UDEV. You've got to have the right versions of Modem Manager, a KDE client that works with it. You've got to make your adaptations there. And you've got to make all of that happen in a relatively short space of time, because you've got maybe four months of development and four months of testing. And that's your eight-month release cycle at OpenSUSE, and it's all gone. And getting one packager to get one working update of the root package and then get all those cascading changes to happen in time, that takes a lot of work. Um, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, you've got to deliver updates at, at the right pace for users as well. You've got to make sure that they're getting them, um, but you're not updating things so fast that they can't get, uh, can't get to use them. Um, if we went, um, Amarok versions change very rapidly. Um, lots of new features come in. People don't tend to upset, get upset about that, but on other packages, you'd have um, a pace of change which can be a bit high. 
And you've got to manage your business and your upstream needs. You have your enterprise desktop or enterprise releases where you want to ship stuff that's well tested. But that might mean that you have to have uh, software that's been released once in the community distribution. And the one that you're going to release in the community distribution you know is really bad and it just fell off the back of a lorry and it's bleeding edge and not really finished. But you're going to do that because you know you have to release an enterprise um, version a year down the line or else you're going to be out of sync with all your competitors. And you've got to make that happen without breaking the community distribution if you can possibly do it. So there's a lot happening. And that's now. And this is where the pen comes in handy. This is my graph. I'm, not, I'm just doing that. No. No. Yay! <laughs> so features over time. In the beginning, we had this in 1993, one floppy disk, one kernel on it, that was just about enough to get do some work. The Linux kernel fit on, on uh, 720 or 1.4 megabytes. And pretty much features equaled expectations because the people working on it were the people developing it. A little bit further along, instead of one, you had a big stack of floppy disks and you had floppy disk A floppy with um, the kernel with uh, libc on it, floppy disk B with um, some C standard libraries and that, all the way down to floppy disk, disk X, which had your X server on it. And yep, still Slackware, same, same story. And it was also, you had some more features, but the um, expectations of the users were all right, so I've put another, another set of data on this side. We've got, here's our expectations, and they're at the same level. So they're happy there. Along came, about, uh, along came 1999, 1998, 2000, internet bubble. All, everyone, all your venture capitalists had too much money from whatever preceded it, and were spending it on the internet, and anything which ran on a computer when they ran out of dot-com firms to finance. So all the Linux firms got massive investment which was great because um, they could hire lots of developers and start really competing with Windows on features and, and other incumbents with Solaris. So expectation features, they stayed about the same. But now, where are we now? We're at the phase of real mass adoption of, of Linux. As a result, the amount of features that we want to put in are going up off the chart. However, that was a high watermark for actual direct paid investments in, in Linux. And that kind of money isn't there anymore. So we've got our features, we've got our expectations, and our expectations are up here, and our features are only kind of making it about 80% of the way. It's, it's running out of space. And it's just not um, sustainable any longer that um, distributions are going to be able to do all the work to actually make all these changes, deliver these products, and just pop it out there and give it away for free. And as a result, what we're trying to do is get um, users, developers, downstream projects aware of this and get them to step up. So let's get rid of that one. My next curve is called the evolutionary curve of users and developers. Here we have scales, and this is the, the distribution. And the curve looks like this. But all the time we're getting new people at this end, all these new users, all these people using Ubuntu, using PCBSD, using Fedora, whatever else. Up here you've got your curve, you've got, actually you've got Linus Torvalds, he's like a single data point up here somewhere, he's just so, so great. And here you've got your kernel developers, and here you've got your libc developers and your xorg developers. A little bit further along you've got Qt developers. Somewhere here you've got KD developers and somewhere here are GTK developers. Scriptus users. And we need to get everyone moving up the stack, we need to get us upskilled, moving out of our little niches, realizing that the opportunity is there for you to move up. It's not, none of it is black magic. None of it is 
Um, you have to be born with a certain gene for amazing brainness. You're not going to make it all at the stack, but hey, you're, you're, doing, you're going to be able to make that progress. So we need to get everyone fired up to drag themselves out of their little hot pools of multi-single-celled life and evolving into skilled KD developers, skilled Qt developers, people who know what device drivers are, and working at it. And as Helio said, it's not enough for KD um, fans, KD developers, KD distribution people to sit in their little niches. We've got some great examples of KD work that's been done by distribution people. We've got, um, say, from my corner, K Network Manager, uh, the kickoff menu was done by Suze. You've got KGrub, um, you've got the notification stuff, you've got the printing infrastructure from Kubuntu, um, Mandriva. Net, um, a whole network manager front end of their own, um, a whole um, all the Nepomuk stuff they sponsored, all the K3B stuff they sponsored. But it's not enough for us to be working on these little single things because it means that we, KD is always very uneven. It's going to be good for K3B or good for KGrub on one side or good on K Network Manager, and it's not even. Um, we need to get our distributions to talk to each other. We need to get KDE to form its own downstream almost, to, be, to realize that um, although some of these jobs are boring and very detailed, that it's necessary for KDE to continue to succeed because the distributions aren't going to do it. Or they're going to do it late, or they're going to do it not as well as, as, uh, as the community can because they don't have that broad range of interest. They're going to do the, the minimal stuff. So what am I thinking of? I'm thinking of things like, um, like desktop search, like sound, like um, like a pulse audio integration, we're seeing that now. Um, like network manager, um, peripherals like webcams, like display management. All of these things could be so much better on KDE. Um, and if we just don't, if we leave it to, to a single distribution, it might come next year, it might come in two, three years' time. Package management, K package kit, that needs to be great across the board. Um, System management, all those tools to be able to like set your clock and things. You know, in, it, we, I'm spoiled in, at, at SUSE because we have YAST, which does most of those things. But anyone who's used SUSE knows that YAST hasn't really changed or evolved in the last five or six years. <laughs> yeah, it, it stopped doing some of the ugly things, but, it's, um, but it doesn't look any nicer. And it's not hard to do. So GNOME has all these GNOME system whatever tools. Why doesn't KD have those? We have all the, these infrastructures with things like um, K authorized, sorry, K auth and, um, and policy kit. We could write those little apps. It's not, not hard stuff to do, but it just means we need to step up. Just to wrap it, you mentioned it, like integration policy audio is a very basic example. I want to say that you need to be stubborn, you need to manage things that you're not supposed to do, but there's no way you need to wait. Because if we're, my point of view is not ever, like, I hate Fusiyama. I do publicly, so I speak about that, because it's very difficult, the idea is right, the implementation sucks. And this Uberize at every type of distribution today. But at my point inside Mandriva, I need to integrate, I need to work integration, even with KMix, because something that's present. So it's not pleasant, it's not, probably not the right thing, but I can't escape of this. I need to talk with people on both sides integrate. It's a, it's a very problem that you can see about being attacked in the institution today. So these are, these are my three take-home scenarios. There's three things that we can do. We can just reduce expectations. We can say, you know, you don't need to be able to set your clock as a user. You know, you need to go to the command line and do that. Um, anything else is too complicated. Um, some, some projects are quite successful in selling a lack of features as some kind of simplification or usability. I, mean, I won't name any names. We could just abandon the whole, the whole field to web OSs, which do nothing apart from start a browser, and the rest of it happens in some anonymous server in a server farm running closed source code that you will never see and you will never have control of. Or we can make users contributors. The demand is there, the skills are there, the, we can share those skills, but it's not going to come from, from the small set of distributions and their engineers. There just aren't enough of us to fit those needs. 
So I hope we choose the third way. I hope we can get out, go out there and get those users contributing. OK, that was my part. Um, let's do the questions. No questions? No. Question there. Man the hat. Um, how, uh, how do you see the... Um, well, I guess I have two questions. Um, one is, um, how do you see the... Assuming we pick three, uh, you're, uh, how do we interact between... How do you mix between the people who will give money, the individual users who will give money, and the individual users who can give time and, and skills uh, hmm. and such. How did, um that that? Oh, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought of the, 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 the donating money side of it. Um, I guess we look at projects which do run donations um, like Amarok, uh, like the care office guys. Um, and if we can find, often you will find very bright, very motivated students who it's relatively easy to sponsor for a long time to, um, to do those, make those kind of contributions. That's a good way to do it. And what was your second question? Uh, the second question was, um, how would you go about, um, this is a sort of lar large topic, but um, what, what sort of things do you see that we would need, to, we could do to bring in um, non-technical users? I'm thinking I, I had my mom running uh, an older version of Mangabe at 10 for a number of years, and we had a sort of problem there, getting her into the community, because by the time we wanted to, Mangabe at 10 was rather old. Uh, I recently upgraded her to, um, to, to Ubuntu, not K-Ubuntu, I fault they ought to, but um, just use the default, which is what you both talked about. What do you think we can do to sort of bring in the Zantec users and what kind of dollar box could we put up and say, here, here's how you could actually help us do some work, some things. I have two answers for your question. The first one, uh, you can't. <laughs> because who, uh, who decides this management? Except you have a, cont a contributor apart to the free distribution that you push over. But you can see even Ubuntu today that they close the design for some things. And actually, I think it's right. Even the users saying, complaining about that, I think it's right because users do too much opinion and you can do work at all. But there's cases like uh, uh, one of my contributors in Mandriva at the time, they, they is a really annoying Finnish guy. But they did the whole part of the 7-zip, and they push a lot of Mandriva, and we agreed to put 7-zip working there, uh, and then LZMA, anyway. And after all, I push it for the main, distribution, the main upstream, and it works, and now today, the code for him. So they actually, they implemented a thing that they push a lot harder in Mandriva, and we decided to push upstream, it's better to, to keep maintaining there. That's, so that's a, a two ways you can see. One of the index uh, distributions, we will not allow the users to decide what they do because there are some commercial interests. The other part is community distribution that they have accept some code but try to push it straight to avoid keep maintaining the code that is not theirs. And if I can also add something to answer that question, I think we, we need to increase the apparent surface area of the distributions where people can contribute. So we need to have as many different um, media where people can find out where they can participate, be it f forums for contrib contributors, not just user support, um, be it lists, be it social networking. Um, just, just put yourself out in as many different ways. Her telling her friends that she's doing marketing for me. She's doing my job. That's how you can do it. Yeah. So, the key is it is it making it easy. Mm. I mean, uh, for example, the stuff that's going on in the Get Open Stuff framework, uh, where people can, from one single interface, uh, will be able to upload. Uh, say, for example, you uh, play a puzzle with Polyphony. I hope I can that correctly. Anyway, so uh, you have created a puzzle, which you can simply do from the GUI. If there is simply a button that says, you know, share this puzzle, and, and you don't have to do anything else, it's just now it's shared, and someone else can download it. I mean, you're contributing, right? You're creating a puzzle and sharing it with the world, and it's one click. If you make it easy, people will do it. If they have to, you know, uh, find the files of the puzzle and then, you know, put it in, in a uh, target GZ file, which they probably will make a clue what it is, 
and that's uploaded on some random website. Yeah, it's not going to happen. But if it's one click, it is. So I think the key is, is also making it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. To kind of, sorry if I um, spoil the party here, but the problem is not that we don't have enough people uploading puzzles. No. We don't have enough people writing device drives. Right? So yeah, <laughs> true, true. As I, I go further. <laughs> not only device drivers, middleware. Well, just around an example, my, my point is yeah. the whole thing with the graph is you have to add a lot of volume, right, to get your 1% or 10% or whatever actual people with skill sets to solve the hard problems. Yeah. So, you know, you have to have shitloads of puzzle uploaders so that one of them might one day actually make a meaningful, hard technical contribution, not to devalue uploading puzzles, but that is the fundamental problem, right? And, you know, even if we get, like, massive amounts of scale into this so that we end up with a few morsels of actual, you know, really useful stuff, or we have to find another way. So I, I don't believe in pure volume as a solution. It's also communication, though, because um, a, a, we have a lot of talented KD developers who are just working on apps who could be working lower down the stack with apps that integrate with, with, with the system services, which aren't that hard to program. It just takes time, and it's actually quite re rewarding to do. Anyway, you were going to say. I think one thing is also um, making, making sure that the process from going from a one-click, I've uploaded a puzzle, further into more, to more rare and sort of more useful work um, is sort of as easy and like a nice big bright door like here. If you enjoyed getting the response from your puzzle upload, here's something else that we could do. Here's how you could look about learning it. Here's like, the process. Bug reports are a much better way to do that. Because you already have someone motivated enough to tell you about a problem. Mm. Yes, um, except and then that can be Except the fact that you don't look at the amount of like, the amount of bug reports you have. Right. They're right, okay, but you have 200, 300. Sometimes that I saw one of the plasma desktop that more than 50 people open the same bug, and there's people lo losing time just to mark it as duplicated. So it's just take time. Even bug reports being a good idea, the project is escalating at so big that it's become very difficult. So getting to solving Will's actual problem, though, one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is this idea of you have some people that should be able to move up the stack that are developers that have the skills to do these things, but they're tied down with spending time on closing duplicate bug reports and things like that. You could take, sorry, you could take your casual user like your mom that you're describing, put them on some of these other tasks like closing duplicate bug reports, that gives the person that does have the skill set to do this higher yeah. up the tech stack kind of thing more yeah. time to actually work on it. It's, it's, it's low hanging fruit and heavy lifting. And this is something that we try and do in the OpenSUSE KDE community, is empower our users to do the, to, to do the low-hanging fruit stuff. And the guys with five years of full-time experience like myself who can reverse engineer a network manager and write a client for it in one release cycle, then have more time to do that. And uh, let us tell a scary, uh, scary talk for you to thinking about the distros and how the things escalated from time to time. In about uh, 2006 or 2007, when the uh, venting started, uh, the, the whole netbook and small distributions and the uh, live CDs everywhere. So we need to have a small KDE. So that connective will start to split in packages. And, of course, at the end, when they left Madriva, our number of packages generated by the standard KDE distribution without apps is 476 packages. Which applied this for four distributions, and four, and four distributions at the same time with different package set, different patches because they're older versions for libraries for libraries, and users pressing you to have all the new release for KD launching for four distributions. And basically, how many people you think are working on this at this time? Mm. Two. Yeah. Because we have other, the other two Madriva KD developers that are working on interface for clients, customers, and everything. So basically, in two persons, one contributor and me, we are doing basically compilations, simultaneous and tests for four distributions and generating more than 100, 1,200 packages hmm. per ever, four months, hmm. three months. Yeah. Any way you look at it, any way you look at them, the statistics and show that we have a massive problem of scale yeah. of our success. And then I'm talking just KDE. I myself was taking care of about 300 different packages alone hmm. because KDE, not KDE only. So it's, we have 
very difficult things inside yeah. distributions today. Anyway, I think you want to wrap us up, yeah, but um, uh, if I can close. Wrap okay. you guys up. Enough. Yeah, it's some sort of cellophane. <laughs> and, uh, Just to close. Um, it's a nice beach back there. So no. <laughs> on you guys do amazing work, and we're all very happy that, uh, that you came here to talk about distributions. And, uh, and on, you're, Monday, you're my hero. on Monday, I'm going to be talking about the OpenSUSE build service and how it can be used to spread KD all over the, dis the, the free software space, not just OpenSUSE. So if you're here on Monday, please come along to that. <laughs>